Rory Sutherland, Vice Chairman, Ogilvy UK, TED Talk Superstar, Columnist, and Writer. After 30 years in this industry, I've come to the very sad conclusion that in many ways it is the stupidest industry in the world. Okay. So first of all, it completely fails to take its own advice. So it's trying to sell advertising as if advertising could be reduced to a narrow Newtonian science. Now, selling advertising on its efficiency is a bit like trying to sell Coca-Cola on its ingredients. It's not completely irrelevant, but it completely misses out on the magic that you create when you put those ingredients together that there's something far greater than the sum of its parts. And we're becoming obsessed with the parts of advertising, and we're forgetting the whole. And I would argue we're trying to make advertising the wrong kind of science. We're trying to turn it into kind of engineering, or economics, or Newtonian physics, when a better science might be the science of magic, of pure alchemy. Because that's really what advertising does. And every time we get a chance to do this, we actually chicken out. We bottle it. We make utterly insane decisions. Early in my career, the separation of media and creative was the most batshit, ridiculous, and stupid decision to take imaginable. It was taken for financial reasons. No one has ever come to me with a reason which explains why the work might be better as a result. Um, all that happened, uh, in a sense, was that you separated media and creative at the very time this shouldn't have happened. It was the worst possible moment for this to happen. And you now have people in media agencies who've never met a copywriter, and vice versa, by the way. This is a horrible state of affairs, because there are a lot of problems which we can solve using the magic that advertising can produce, but they're kind of problems a bit like a Sudoku, okay? You can't solve one of those problems by cutting it up into nine squares and handing them to nine different people. If you can't see the whole grid, you can't solve the problem. And what we also fail to realize is the extent to which we are entirely undervalued by most areas of the business world. And there's a reason for this, which I'm going to go into in rather nerdy detail. Most business decision-making is dominated by finance people, just as most government decision-making is dominated by lawyers and economists. Most of you don't realize this, but there is, within economic theory, non-Austrian economic theory, if I'm being technical, an inherent devaluation of advertising and marketing. The assumption of standard mainstream economics is that value is inherent in the product, the consumer is making a decision under conditions of perfect trust and perfect information, they know exactly how much they're prepared to pay for something, what utility they'll derive from it, and therefore, essentially, they've created a model of the world which is commonly used elsewhere in business where marketing and advertising needn't exist. If you completely trusted the person you were buying from, first and foremost, and secondly, you knew exactly um, what you were going to get from what you were buying, and if the value of that product were not affected at all by the context or framework in which you perceived it, I freely admit you wouldn't need a marketing and advertising discipline at all. The problem this creates is that most people in finance tend to see marketing and advertising as a necessary evil. It's essentially something which you do as little of as you possibly can. It's not seen as a source of value creation. It's seen as something you do as efficiently as possible because in a perfect world you wouldn't need to do it at all. The fact that we've allowed this to happen is kind of terrible. And so I'd like you to define for a second, which I think is a really useful way of looking at marketing. It's actually the science of knowing what economists are wrong about. Go and spend a week studying mainstream economics. If you've worked in this industry for any length of time, you'll realize that the model they use is crazy. It makes assumptions simply for the purpose of attaining mathematical neatness, which are rubbish. Furthermore, and this is really important, there are thousands and thousands of problems in the world, in which, by the way, I'll place my wash basin at home and the environmental crisis, which can't be solved by economic thinking because they're not remotely economic. I'll start with my wash basin. It, it's easier. Okay. 
six months ago, my wash basin cracked at home. I think it's fair to say that if I could have waved a credit card, a contactless credit card, over my wash basin and had it repaired instantaneously for a fee of 300 euros, say, I would have done that immediately. The day it happened, I would have replaced the wash basin. It annoys the hell out of me, it leaks, you can't fill it up beyond about two inches. The whole thing's a disaster. But I still haven't done it. Six months later, it hasn't been done. That has nothing to do with economics. It's nothing to do with benefits, and it's nothing to do with costs. It's to do with the fact that the actual path, the choice architecture of fixing a sink, is a royal pain in the ass. You have to find a time when a plumber's available, when you're at home, etc., etc., where your wife has to agree on the taps. Once you get a kind of multiple complicated decision like that, the obstacle to action, this is also true of the environmental movement, <laughs> incidentally, the obstacle to action is very little to do with the kind of things that economists study. By the way, if anybody here works for TaskRabbit or works for um, trusted um, traders or local heroes, any of those websites that are trying to solve that problem, they've also got it wrong. They ask you the question, what do you need done? And you go, I need a plumber to fix the wash basin. I think there's a billion pounds in the UK, in the US, in every large country, I think there's a billion pounds of economic value being squandered in what you might call home handiwork by the fact that they're actually asking the wrong question. The question to ask is, when are you next going to be at home all day? Okay? And I can answer, well, I work from home most Fridays, so I'm going to be at home this Friday, and I'm going to be at home next Friday. And then they can say, well, on those two Fridays, we have free a plumber, a carpenter, a handyman, a guy who can paint things, and a plasterer. How many of them do you want? If any of those companies want to take, take me up on this, if it works, just give me a few pounds and maybe a couple of days of handiwork just to say thank you. What I'm saying there is it's nothing to do with price, it's to do with things like coordination. The environmental movement, this, by the way, I, I think is rather beautiful. So during the Extinction Rebellion crises, uh, this girl's actually a student at one of the creative colleges in London. And she's one of the very few protesters who is doing something which is, tell me something I can do. Don't shout at me, don't get angry, don't just meaninglessly disrupt the traffic. Give me steps I can take. Now, my proposal for the environmental movement is very simple. You need to get experts to come up with eight actions we all need to take. Maybe we need to be vegan for six months. Okay? Maybe we need to install solar panels, buy an electric car, not own a car at all. Maybe we need to pledge not to fly at all for nine months of the year, every year. Give eight actions which we can take and ask us to choose four. See what happens then. No one's tried that. Instead, there are a lot of people who are very angry, quite justifiably, but they're trying to get everybody to do everything at once. Change never happens like that. So, what you must all realize is by dint of possessing, it doesn't matter where you work in marketing, by dint of possessing what I call the marketing mindset, you have a view on the world which is unique and irreplaceable. Because unlike nearly everybody else in an organization, whether it's government you work for, or whether it's, for example, a business, you see the world through the eyes of a consumer living life over time. Most businesses don't see their consumers like this. Most people in business don't see their consumers like this. They see them as an aggregate snapshot. Every now and then, they, they add all their consumers together, they create an average, and they watch how that average changes over time. Every time you create an average, you lose information. Every time you create an average, you lose the facility to solve a problem, because solving for the average is really, really hard. Recently, I spoke to a train company in the UK, and I said, you're trying to reduce train overcrowding, aren't you? And they said, yes. And I said, you'll never do that, because it's really, really difficult, because there will always be times when lots of people decide to travel on the same train. It's almost impossible without having an insane amount of surplus capacity to solve that problem. Split the problem up into individual travelers, however, and things become more interesting. Ten people who have to stand on a train 10% of the time doesn't matter. One person who ends up standing 100% of the time does matter. Once you've split the problem up that way, it's actually quite an easy problem to solve. 
For example, people with an annual season ticket should probably be the people who are allowed to sit in first class if they can't get a seat. You could run a few extra trains only for annual season ticket holders. If you solve the problem where it matters, it's a much easier problem to solve. If you try and solve them for the average, it's intractable and impossible. And what environmental campaigners are trying to do is they're trying to solve for the average. And it ain't going to work. Now, just to be clear about this, there's a whole science around this, which I've recently discovered. Don't worry, it's called ergodicity, and you don't need to know about this. It's a concept that arose in physics in the middle of the last century. But what ergodicity is, very crudely, is the difference between looking at everything in an aggregate way and looking at everything in a time series. Marketers are probably the only people within an organization who take the time series point of view. Think about this, OK? Nearly everywhere across Europe, whenever house prices go up, the press presents it as a good news story. Because on average, lots of people are getting richer. If you look at it from the point of view of any individual who isn't 70 years old, it's bad news. If you don't own a house, it means it's more fucking expensive to buy your first one. And if you're already owning a house and you've just had kids and you need to move into a bigger house, it's going to be more expensive to trade up. So except for people who are planning to downsize or for people who are waiting for their parents to die, a rise in house prices is basically bad news. And yet the press, because they're looking at the average, present it as good news. This is a weird example from these two guys at the London Mathematical Laboratory. This is the nerdiest session you'll have all day, I promise you this. Okay? Even, they make the point that even mathematics is contextually dependent. Are you looking at the average, or are you looking at what happens to an individual over time? Take this bet, OK? You all put all your money into the, in, into the table, let's say £100 for now. And someone tosses a coin. And if they throw heads, your wealth goes up by 50%. And if they throw tails, your wealth goes down by only 40%. And most of you are thinking, that's a good bet. In fact, I'd like to take that bet as much as I possibly can. Because what you're doing is you're averaging what happens to four people when they take the bet once. And what happens to four people when they take the bet once is you get two with 150, two with 60. That's a total of 420. They started with 400. So on average, they're getting richer by 5% every time. Right? As you'd expect. Fair? And so you probably all think, as I did when I first saw this, great, put all my money into the table and just keep that coin running. I'm off to the Bahamas with the winnings. If you're an individual playing your part in this game, it ain't so good. Let's look at what happens after you've tossed the coin twice. The guy with heads heads is loaded. He started with 100 pounds, he's now got 225. Two other people are now poorer than when they started. In fact, they're 10% worse off than when they started. They've now got 90, the heads, tails, and the tails, heads guy, right? And the fourth guy, who's thrown tails twice, is seriously screwed, OK? He's now got 36 pounds. He has to throw three heads in a row just to get his initial stake back. So there are things that look great in the average that look completely different when you look at them over time. And what this means, interestingly, is it means that all economists are fundamentally wrong about what humans are trying to do. Because we're not trying to maximize for the average, we're trying to maximize our chances over time. When you want to maximize under multiplicative dynamics, when you want to maximize the time average growth rate over time, what you want to do is not optimize, you want to reduce variance. And that's because 2 plus 2 is the same as 1 plus 3. If you're adding, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, however, is not the same as 1 times 3 times 1 times 3 times 1 times 3. It's much bigger. Now, instinctively, this means that for humans under evolutionary conditions, it pays you to reduce variance. In 1960, in probably the most important advertising conversation in the uh, 20th century, David Ogilvy and a man called Joel Raffleson had a conversation in Chicago. And Joel said to David, he said, I don't think people buy brand A rather than brand a, B because they think it's better. I think they buy it because they're more confident that it's good. 
And I think therein lies a really interesting bit of maths. We're buying brands, we're paying a premium for brands, not necessarily because they're better, but because we're really, really confident that they're not terrible. It's a low variance outcome, buying a brand, compared to taking a risk on something you've never heard before. That's why McDonald's is the most popular restaurant in the world. It's not because it's very, very good, it's because it's really, really good at not being terrible. Okay? Do you know what Hussein Bolt eats for three weeks before he competes in an Olympic final? Chicken McNuggets. Okay? Now, you'd assume he'd say, my body is a temple, I have my own quinoa chef to prepare me extraordinary. No, because he says, there are only two things that really matter. He said, I get loads of protein and I don't get ill. That's all that really matters. And so, once you start to look at life through the marketer's lens, which is what happens over time versus what happens in an average ensemble, you come up with answers and you spot problems that nobody else in your business can see. One of the things I think we've got to get better at, and one of the areas where I think advertising's gone wrong, ad agencies haven't been paid on commission since basically about 1992, but we still behave as though we are. We still focus on the bought media part of the solution first. I don't see why that should be so. I would argue the place to focus in any brand, in any service, in any product, is you start with the end. If the experience is no good, there's no point in doing great advertising because people will only buy your product once. If your conversion's no good, there's no point in doing great advertising because you'll create desire without action, which is kind of fruitless and pointless. Get the end right, and then work on the beginning. And I think creative agencies have made the mistake of doing it the wrong way around. We focused on the beginning without worrying on the end. Let me give you a few examples of the things you spot when you look at life as it's lived in real time. I wanted to buy an electric car. So I went to the local garage which sells electric cars and I said, I'd like to buy an electric car. And they said, it's great, you get a subsidy, quite a generous subsidy. I said, fantastic. But before I'm going to buy an electric car, I need one of those seven kilowatt plugs at home so I can charge my car reasonably quickly. Because I'm not going to spend you know, a five-figure sum on an electric car and then spend three years with a cable coming out of my bathroom window where it takes 16 hours for me to charge the bastard. So I go along and say, I'd like to install one of those plugs, please. And they said, there's a really generous subsidy. I said, that's great. So it's normally 500 pounds, but you get 250 pounds from the government for installing the sodding plug. I said, sign me up right now. They said, you've got to prove you own an electric car. Now, no one in the Department of Transport has clearly read Catch-22, have they? OK. The point I made is, you can actually solve the problem much more easily than we think. If you can encourage people to install one of those plugs, you don't need to subsidise the electric car that much. Because if I spent £250 on a plug outside my house, I'm basically going to buy an electric car, aren't I? Because I'd feel a bit of a dickhead buying a diesel. <laughs> right? Uber, I think, is a fantastic case where it created value just by getting the informational certainty at every moment right. If you remember what I said, that people hate variance. That's why people like brands. They hate variance, they hate uncertainty. And a brand is a kind of promise of certainty. What Uber did is a brilliant piece of this. It removed all the anxiety points of ordering a taxi. One, before you even press a button to order, it gives you an estimate of how long you might expect to wait. That's psychological genius, by the way. Because even when the waiting time is quite long, you've been prepared for it, so when the taxi comes up and it's, it, it warns you it might be 15 minutes for a taxi, and the taxi comes up and says, I'm going to be 13 minutes, you're not angry, you're actually slightly pleased because it's better than you expected. Waiting for the taxi, we would rather wait for 15 minutes watching a taxi approach on a map than wait for eight minutes in a state of uncertainty. Okay? Once you understand that humans have evolved to really, really crave certainty and low variance, because that's the evolutionary safe strategy, loads and loads of brilliant things suddenly make sense which didn't make sense before. Uber is a case, is Uber is really psychological innovation rather than technological innovation. If you want my cynical point of view, I think we've kind of run out of technology for the next five to ten years. Nobody ever believes me when I say this. But actually, the low-hanging fruit, technologically, has probably been picked. What remains to be exploited is psychological innovation, which is what happens to people's propensity to repair a wash basin when you present the choices the other way around.
That kind of thing we need to do a lot more testing and experimentation in. You can solve massive problems easily once you look at life through the lens of the consumer over time and understand their real why and their real motivation as distinct from trying to solve a problem in the average. In the UK, we have this huge debate about whether we spend 60 to 70 to 80 billion pounds on High Speed 2, which is a high speed rail link connecting London with Manchester. And not, by the way, I'm not wholly against high speed rail. There are city pairs where it makes fantastic sense. But I simply made the point that I could reduce journey time to Manchester and increase capacity to Manchester, and it would cost a quarter of a million pounds and it would take a year, rather than costing 60 billion pounds. And all the engineers said, that's bollocks, there's no way you can do that. And I said, it's really, really easy. I can do it easily. Because every time I actually book a ticket to Manchester, I book an advanced ticket. Because otherwise they cost about a billion pounds. And because I'm frightened of missing the one train on which my ticket's valid, I turn up at Euston Station about 45 minutes before the train's due to leave, because I can't afford to miss the train. As a result, two trains leave half empty for Manchester in the 45 minutes in which I'm waiting for my correct train. I said, all you need to do is have an app that says, I'm at Euston now, and the app replies, pay five pounds, and you can board a train 40 minutes before your book train, and you can have seat J8. Maybe pay two pounds, you can board a train 20 minutes early. Now, that way, I've reduced my journey time by 40 to 20 minutes, which is two-thirds as good as High Speed 2 would achieve, and I've increased the capacity of the network. Uh, just to explain that, you, in yield management, you should always allow people to travel on earlier empty seats because you aren't going to sell them to anybody else, whereas if someone takes an earlier train, they vacate the seats on a later train, which someone else might need. So it's much better in terms of load balancing that you allow people to travel early. I said with a tiny tweak to pricing and with a small app, you could achieve maybe 25% of the benefits of something that costs 60 billion quid. But all the people were looking at time saving as the time from the train leaving to the train arriving. You don't want to reduce that in time. That's the most productive part of my whole day. I enjoy sitting on the fucking train. It's standing around at the station I don't like. Okay? Anybody who's a business person knows that actually two hours on a train is a brilliant opportunity to actually get some shit done without interruptions. In fact, it's the meeting in Manchester you're traveling to that's probably a waste of time, to be absolutely honest. It's vital that we understand that every part of a choice has to be made easy. And I think Uber is a model of this, by the way. It doesn't necessarily make financial sense its valuation, but as a psychological insight, it's genius. You can have everything upstream brilliant, but if you get the point of sale wrong or you get the last mile wrong, you still fail. And I always wanted to demonstrate this, but then obviously no client's going to say, hey, why don't you take a brilliant product and do terrible point of sale for it just to prove your point. But by a happy accident, two Melbourne comedians did the job for me. They got the world's, probably the world's most fashionable performer, and they sold him in a really, really terrible way. And this is what happened. Click. Hello. Hi. Whee! Peep shows. They have a pretty bad name, normally associated with lewd content, but by definition, they don't have to be. So in an attempt to change that, we took one of the world's biggest performing artists, kept all his clothes on, and set up an Ed Sheeran peep show. Would anyone dare to believe what was written outside and come in to our very dodgy-looking venue? How are you feeling? I don't really know what's going on, you? <laughs> <laughs> that was fair enough, because we dressed Hamish as a fairly shady-looking spruker in charge of getting customers. I got your Sheeran. Who wants some Sheeran? All right, I can hear Hamish. Do you think I we'll should... get anyone? I don't think we'll get anyone. It's going to be a brave soul. I wouldn't I wouldn't come in to... If there was a dude with a beard with a hat and say, like, come in and see this. Ed was right. This was going to be tough. You want a peep at Ed Sheeran for two bucks? Insurance. Do you want a peep at Ed Sheeran? Your loss. What do you reckon, big fella? Got Ed Sheeran in here. Beautiful ginger head man. Sitting on a stool. What do you reckon? Two bucks. Got Ed Sheeran just sitting on a stool in there. You want him? Two bucks. Two bucks for a peep. Think about it. It's actually pretty good value. Despite trying, we'd had a total lack of interest for over 50 minutes. It's been some time. <laughs> <laughs> we should have got you a more comfy chair, I think. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. 
Hey, big fella, I got all the shearing you need in there, two bucks. What is it? All the Ed Sheeran you need. All the what? Ed Sheeran. Oh, I don't know what that is. He's a singer. Yeah? Is that a yes? No? I think one of the big problems is people think Ed Sheeran's a code word for a new drug. How's it going? You guys like Ed Sheeran? Two bucks. Two bucks for a 30 second peep. No, mate. What, like, are they just saying no? Yeah. Category. Dirt cheap peep. Dirt cheap peep. Here we go, two bucks. Do you reckon we're pricing it too high? And that's why we're not getting people coming in. I think two dollars is pretty fair. <laughs> Here we go, boys. It's a Friday. Get you a cheer and peep show. Two bucks. Sitting on a stool. Play your song. If someone actually does think it's a peep show, I might quickly give you the go ahead to take off all your clothes. Are you willing to do that? Uh, I've been drinking a lot of beer recently. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. You're not. A couple of months ago, maybe, but yep. yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in shape. It's just the shape of a potato. <laughs> Two hours in. And Hamish was getting more desperate. And Sharon is literally sitting in there on the stage waiting for your two dollars. We were feeling it as well. But just when we thought this had been a giant waste of everyone's time. You guys like it, Sharon? I love it. You love it, Sharon? Two bucks? Peep show. Just got him sitting on stage in there. Oh, you lying. Well, two bucks. It's gonna, it's gonna cost you two bucks. You only get 30 seconds though. You wanna come in? Mate? I don't believe you. Well, I was the only one who won't find out. We might be on here. Here we go, Ed Sheeran Peep Show. He's there till midday. <laughs> All right, your choice. No, she did the smart thing and walked away. <laughs> Listen, if you, guys, if you guys want to... <laughs> I'm just saying, if you guys want to have a go, he's sitting in there by himself, it'll probably get busy later on. Two bucks, 30 seconds. I mean, you both can come if you want. Just two bucks ahead. Everything's above board, I can assure you. I'm gonna get uh, no, nah, absolutely not. Like, I can't guarantee what it'll do, but uh, yeah, let's pay you two bucks. And after two hours and 23 minutes, including some final hesitation, we finally found people brave enough to take a peek. Did you guys go to peep shows a lot, or? No, oh, f me, some kind of There you go, mate. Keep your clothes on, stay on the seat, behave yourselves. Just listen to the announcement, have a good one. Enjoy your peep. Hello, and welcome to the peep show. Your time will start in five seconds. I'm actually a bit scared. <laughs> Darling, I will oh be loving God. you till we're 70. <laughs> Baby, my heart can still fall as hard at 23. And I'm thinking about how people fall in love your time is finished. Oh, Thank you very much for peeping. All right, guys, there you go. Oh. Have fun. Oh. Now, show that to any of your colleagues if they think everything's about economics, OK? Do you hear that wonderful suggestion, maybe we're pricing it too high? The default economist suggestion, if you're not selling. But there are lots of ways you could have solved that problem if you put an ad in the newspapers. You probably could have charged $200 and had a queue around the blog. Okay. If you'd actually hired actors to form a queue, you would have created social proof and other people would have joined the queue. Okay. There are loads of ways you could have solved it. In the end, they solve it with a bit of behavioural science by saying it's going to get busy later on and he's only there till midday. Scarcity value. Not about economic measures. And most of the world's problems remaining, I would argue, are no longer really just about economics. In particular, one of the things we've got to watch in advertising terms is this model of advertising. We spend far too much time testing media in the digital world and trying to optimise that, and far too little time testing different creative approaches, which is where the magic really potentially lies. Okay? You know, efficient advertising can find customers. Great advertising, effective advertising, creates them. Nature understands this. A flower is basically a weed with a marketing budget. And um, there, there's a kind of model of advertising which is becoming prominent, which is distribution model. It's, it's logistics. How can we get a message, doesn't really matter what the message is, to the right person at the right time as efficiently as possible. And some advertising works like that. It's not a totally vacuous thing to do. It's not a waste of time. Lots of advertising doesn't work like that. It works probabilistically. It works because you don't know who your future customers are going to be. You don't know where your market lies. You don't know much about the future. And therefore, the best thing you can do is be famous, 
Because when you're famous, you are exposed to more opportunities. And opportunities tend to be positive. I've got teenage children. It drives me crazy. I just want to stay at home in the evenings. They want to go out. Okay? Anybody with teenage children, you end up picking them up from some scuzzy bar at 2 o'clock in the morning because they're obsessed with going out. And if I ask them, why do you keep going out all the bloody time? You know, what's wrong with the Discovery Channel? Okay? They'll basically say, because I might get lucky. They don't, know how, they don't know how it's going to happen in advance. They don't have a plan. They don't have a strategy. They just know that you might meet someone. It might be romantic. It might be sexual. It might be a, a career opportunity. Someone might invite you on holiday. You might m make a new friend. You might learn some useful information. None of which will happen if you stay at home. And in the same way, if you're famous, let's imagine you're a B2B company. If you're famous, it's impossible to plan in advance how the fame will pay. And it's impossible to attribute the value of fame thereafter. Does that mean that because you can't predict it and you can't attribute it, you shouldn't do it at all? That's like saying to my daughters, unless you can actually say specifically what's the value of going out and do a cost-benefit analysis, I'm not prepared to let you go out. They're right, I would be wrong, OK? If you think about it, OK, very simply, you're a famous company. When your chief executive rings someone up, the person calls back. People come to you with good ideas because they've heard of you. People come to you with suggestions for partnerships because they've heard of you. People want to work for you because they've heard of you. People work for you for less money because your name's famous and they want it on their CV. Okay? Now, none of those things can ever be attributed to a particular marketing activity, but they're really, really valuable. Does that mean that we should take such a reductionist approach to the value of advertising that anything that basically can't be predicted in advance and attributed in retrospect shouldn't be done at all? Because if we do that, we're grossly undervaluing the, the value of advertising. Flowers are big because the bigger your flowers are, the more bees and insects come along and have a look. It's basically how it works. They just find that probabilistically, on balance, Petals pay off. You don't need to split it down into individual B journeys to justify your activity. Something that works in general still works. And so my final plea, really, because my time's up, is we're trying to turn advertising into a science by making it like a Newtonian science. Now, the great problem of science, if you try and make it like Newtonian physics, is the first rule of science is no magic. OK? You know, second law of thermodynamics, heat cannot be created or destroyed. You can't get something from nothing. And if you follow that kind of scientific mentality, you'll deny the really extraordinary thing about marketing, which is from time to time, you can create value out of nowhere. Economics notice by trying to be like physics, this is Milton Friedman, what's his famous phrase? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, actually, of course, that's rubbish. We've all had loads of them, and they're better than the kind you have to pay for. OK? But the idea that nothing can be created out of nothing is an incredibly dangerous mentality to have when you're engaged in marketing. You can make shit things brilliant by telling a different story about them. OK? Nespresso is probably the best case in point. OK? If you had to buy Nespresso in a jar for an equivalent dosage of caffeine, a jar of Nespresso would cost 30 or 40 euros. And you look at that and you go, there's no way I'm paying that. You can get, you know, ground coffee for a tenth the price doesn't come in a jar, it comes in a pod. So when you use your 49 cent Nespresso pod, your frame of reference isn't Nescafe, it's not ground coffee, it's Starbucks. And you think, well, it's 49p, would it cost me £2.30 in Starbucks? This machine's basically making me money. Genuinely, what something is does not depend on what it is, it depends on the frame of mind that the perceiver brings to it. For years, every time my plane landed and there was a bus, not an air bridge, I was really pissed off, as was everybody else on the plane. Ah, oh, shit, it's a bus. You know that thing, the engines wind down, you're a mile from the airport terminal. Ah, oh, shit, it's a crapping bus. And then one day I had a pilot who brilliantly, we landed, the engines wound down, we were nowhere near the airport, and he said, I've got some bad news and some good news. Now, he waited before we'd landed to say that. You don't want to hear that at 30,000 feet, right? I've got some bad news and good news. The bad news is I won't be able to get you an air bridge because there's a plane blocking our gate. The good news is the bus will take you all the way to passport control so you won't have far to walk through the airport with your carry-on bags. And we all looked at each other and thought, shit, that's always true, isn't it? 
I'd always just seen as the bus as a shittier way than an air bridge of getting to the airport terminal. As a way of getting out of the airport, it's better than an air bridge because it takes you 500 yards that you don't have to walk. He rebranded the bus from being an inconvenience to being a conveyance. Next time you're on a plane and there's a bus, just say very loudly to your companion, actually, I'm glad there's a bus because it'll take you all the way to passport control. You've synthesized happiness in everybody around you by causing them to look at something differently. Advertising has always done this. The top line is an ad for Hertz. The top sentence basically says, you're more likely to get lower prices, the car you want, car availability, um, all those things, you know, a wide range of airports served if you go with Hertz, because it's number one in rental cars. You flip attention onto the attitude of a company rather than the capacity of a company, and suddenly what was a weakness becomes a strength. That capacity of advertising to turn a bug into a feature, good things come to those who wait for Guinness, reassuringly expensive for Stella Artois, okay? That capacity to take a weakness and turn it into a strength is pure alchemy. It's the most magical thing we can do, and time and time again, we fail to do it because we're obsessed with the minutiae. Once you understand human perception, you understand it's comparative. Hold up your hand and cover the join between the top and bottom of those grey and white things, and you'll see that the top and bottom are, in reality, exactly the same colour. Our brain manufactures contrast. It assumes there's a bit of a shadow at the bottom, so it better make the bottom brighter. We don't perceive the world objectively. If you want to change perception of time, you can reduce the length of a wait, or you can reduce the frustration of a wait. The second is easier and more effective and cheaper than the first. Stop measuring reality. Reality doesn't map neatly onto emotion. Here is an NHS waiting room. You come in, it's accident and emergency, and you basically, typically, waiting times might be two or three hours. You can try and solve that by employing loads more doctors, or you can solve the problem psychologically. Do you know what you do? You get the, allow the person to come in, you see them with a triage nurse quite quickly, and you say, you'll need to see the specialist. And then while they're waiting for the specialist, you show them through into a different waiting room. They feel they're making progress, and they'll sit there happily for two hours. If you send them back to the initial waiting room, they go batshit insane after about half an hour. Okay? You can basically manufacture the psychological conditions for contentment and happiness without changing objective reality, e.g. duration, all that much. Uber knows how to do that. Those signs on the platform that, or the bus station that tell you when the next bus is coming. That's changing our perception of time. Patently, time is something we don't perceive objectively. We have phrases like, time flies when you're having fun, or it was the longest five minutes of my life. Okay? We don't perceive time objectively. So once you understand this, this is my li last slide, and I mentioned at the very beginning, Austrian school economists, Ludwig von Mises, Hayek, people like that, understood what we were doing. Nobody else did. This is a phrase from Ludwig von Mises in defense of advertising and marketing. And his point is, by the man who sweeps the floor, he explicitly means marketing and advertising activity. That if you serve Michelin-starred food in a restaurant that smells slightly of poo, okay, or in a restaurant where there's dirt on the floor, or where it's kind of grubby, or the PowerPoints have crud over them, or whatever, okay, nobody will enjoy the meal. Because context affects our perception and experience every bit as much as reality does. We think it's about the food, it isn't just about the food. You can similarly, by the way, they served, um, I think it was um, McDonald's chicken or KFC chicken at an organic food fair in Amsterdam, and everybody went going, oh, you can just taste the wholesomeness and the originality. If you put KFC on a white plate and put some fancy salad on it, people think it's fantastic high-end food, okay? The idea that our evaluation of something is dependent on what the thing is independent of the context in which it's perceived or displayed, is the worst misconception in human problem solving. Once we understand that the Austrians were fundamentally right, that to run a great restaurant, is a, it's not added value. This is the last thing, okay? Marketing does not add value, because that makes it sound like an optional extra. It makes it sound like we're conceding that the value is inherent in the product itself, and marketing adds a little bit of magic fairy dust on top to make it a little bit better. No. Marketing value is intrinsic to the value of the whole thing. If you present the right thing in the wrong way, you've got a worthless product. Once we win that argument, 
all the other arguments fall into place for us. Once we finally get people to abandon that economic view that people are basically only interested in those two things of the objective reality of the product and how much it costs, and we realize that how you present something is the principal determinant of how something's perceived and how something's evaluated and what people will pay for it, then again, 90% of our other problems will go away overnight. This is the one problem we face. Okay? In business, if you had a product that isn't selling, and you just said, our product X isn't selling, we've got to drop the price. Okay? Now, that's the most expensive way of selling a product. You're bribing people to buy your product. And yet, because it's consistent with economic theory, that will get approved in a board meeting in about three minutes. Okay? If you suggested changing the name of the product or repackaging it, your proposal would be argued to death. And this is because of the fundamental asymmetry in business decision making. Creative people, counterintuitive ideas, have to be presented to rational people for approval. The same does not apply the other way around. When people have an apparently rational idea that's consistent with economic theory, do they go, well, this seems to make sense, but let's show it to some really wacky people to see what else they can do? They do not. It's probably right that creative people have to have their ideas evaluated by people more sensible than them. When I fly home tomorrow, I don't want to think that the people who check the wheel nuts on the plane are wildly experimental people, you know. <laughs> let's try anti-clockwise this time for the lols, right? I don't want air traffic control to be full of jokers. But at the same time, unpoliced logic is allowed to run rampant. And it's never questioned. And the opportunity cost of being logical is never measured. That's the other problem we've got to solve. Read my book for more. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>